I'm Carly Silver. Um, I'm from Grand Challenges Canada, and I'm really thrilled to have a really um, full room today uh, to talk about um, the important topic of um, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, and for those of you who are sticklers for the fact that um, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health and rights absolutely includes safe abortion, the reason that we called it out explicitly was just because we wanted to be super explicit about that. And the second part of the breakout session is all about access to safe abortion. And so we really wanted to make sure that this was something that was front of mind. We are sitting in a very unique opportunity policy-wise that we can have these discussions and really push forward the world um, on this topic. And so in the spirit of Canadian leadership and um, trying to figure out how we can harness the best of what this country has, but also make it serve the rest of the country um, and maybe even have to step up for some other kind of other countries that are um, not going the way that we would like to, then and um, this is all the more imperative for us to um, make some solid steps forward. The panel we're going to have today, we're really thrilled to have three really different perspectives um, that uh, once Nikki's on stage, she'll be the, the, oh, you are there. Oh, my gosh, how did you do that? <laughs> we have three amazing speakers that are going to give us a perspective. And really what I've asked them to do is to tell really concretely what are the challenges, the big barriers that you're seeing right now that still exist for people to access um, sexual reproductive health and rights. The second is, how does that really affect a person? So I'm hoping they're gonna tell us a bit of a story about an individual or someone who, um, who can kind of tell us and ground that um, maybe theoretical barrier into an actual person's life. And then what I'm really excited to do is to drive us a little bit to some promising avenues for solutions forward. These are certainly not gonna be the only things that we can move forward, but we're gonna have three people's um, uh, suggestions on stage. And then the second half is going to be all of your opportunity to do a similar type of thing. And I'm not gonna, gonna go into the detail of how we'll run that, but um, just want to flag the attention that you're actually gonna also be needing to answer, especially that first question, what's the critical barrier, and especially around access to safe abortion. So start thinking about that now, and um, I'm going to let these three panelists inspire us a little bit and get the brain juices running. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to this session. Um, my discussion is going to focus on disruption and anonymity among adolescent in accessing reproductive health services, including safe abortion. And the, my discussion is going to focus in Rwanda. Um, I think Patrick highlighted issues of statistics already. Rwanda is a young population. If you look at other countries um, surrounding Rwanda, Uganda is a young population. Tanzania is a young population. Kenya is a young population. And this is the population that is very interested in accessing services. They are very inquisitive and they are very active in trying. So there has been a number of issues that have been highlighted in one of the baseline surveys we did in Rwanda. We did a specific baseline survey for the two projects that uh, Global Affairs Canada is supporting in Rwanda. And the, there are a number of findings that came up. I hope I'm not um, the findings that came up I have summarized them in terms of barriers. And one of them is high teenage pregnancies, uh, limited contraceptive uh, services and safe abortions, which have resulted into complications. Uh, there is increased burden of uh, limited resources in households because these young kids, when they get pregnant, they drop out of school and they go back to the household and that impacts on the resource base of the household. Um, when we look at Rwanda, Rwanda has 
a very um, supportive policy in terms of SRH. It has very good establishments of structures that can be used. I will give a few examples. Rwanda has in each health center a youth-friendly facility where youth can access services. In every health, in every hospital, Rwanda has a one-stop center where youth can access services. These are two things, maybe I should spend time to explain the difference between the two. The youth-friendly services, there is a limitation that you can access all the other services except legal services. And when you move to the health center, to, to the hospital, to the one-stop center, they access everything, including legal services. Now, in our programming from this baseline and the implementation we have taken up, we find that as we programmed with an assumption that we can generate interest among youth for HR services, this has worked very well. But the youth do not access services in their areas, in their locations. They move distances to other places to access services. Why? The reason they said in all the focus group discussions we had is that they fear their parents to learn that they are asking for a condom, they are asking for family planning services because Rwanda is strong in culture. So the best is to move very far. They can walk five kilometers to go to another place where they, they assume that they are not known. And therefore, they will not be reported. The other aspect or an avenue where they access services is to walk to another location, go to a private clinic. Because there you pay and you don't have so many questions. So that is the disruption. Now when we get into abortion services, the SRH policy in Rwanda is explicit. Abortion is illegal. However, elective abortion is acceptable through court order. You can access elective abortion through a court order. Go to the court, the judge looks at the issue, and then he will sanction you can get that abortion. The other kind of abortion that is acceptable by the policy is therapeutic abortion. Therapeutic abortion is simple, quicker, because it's sanctioned by the medical doctor after clear examinations to save a life of a mother. So post-abortion services are very free and you can access them at any time whenever you need them. However, there is a catch. If it's selective abortion and you did it illegally, and this is what the youth are doing because it's difficult to get a court order. So they go to traditional people who use local medicine to do an abortion. Now, if they come to the health center or to the hospital for post-abortion services, they have to be very polite. Otherwise, if that case is reported to the police by the health worker, then they are bound to, to face the law and they can get imprisoned. Now, what is ADRA doing? ADRA has developed messages that we, can, that we are using to educate people on self-abortion, access to HR services, 
um, including advising them not to go for illegal abortion through uh, traditional people. We, we have also encouraged groups, uh, adolescent youth groups and clubs. We initially have 56 that are working now, that are now providing peer education to the others. And uh, it's very interesting because one of the issues, the highlights, the youth brought forward is that they need to be empowered because it's easier to access a youth of somebody of the same age. It's easier to access. So they need to be empowered to be the, in the front line for providing HR, um, HRS services. I want to bring forward a few questions. Uh, the moderator has allowed me one minute. Which is done now. <laughs> <laughs> we need to really analyze what are the factors contributing to youth moving out of their areas to access services in other places, spending money. How can we engage parents? I think I asked this question, but I didn't get a good answer. How can we engage the parents? Because culturally, you cannot talk to your son, daughter about buying a condom, going to have sex with somebody else. So how can we engage parents? Because some of the issues we are talking about today are because we, the parents, are quiet. I have boys and girls, one girl, but I've never spent time to talk to them. Yes, it's a fact. So how can we engage ourselves to make sure we can deliver services effectively? What is the definition of the project area? Remember, these children move to other places to seek services in private hospitals, private health centers. In the programming, I think this is where the international uh, agenda should be looking at. Can we ensure that when we are going into an area, we can embrace everyone there, including the health centers, so that the youth will not miss out? Yes. So we also need to look at what promising strategies do we have in place to make sure the youth become more involved and also highlight these issues to parents and make sure there is closeness between parents. I think I will stop there for now. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. So some great um, and very clear, thank you for being so clear around the specific barriers and some interesting kind of uh, paths to what potential solutions could be around uh, really that idea of youth going outside of their area and the uh, breakdown of communication between parents and, and um, kids. So thank you for that as to start us off. Nikki, we're going to go okay. to you now. Um, okay. And I'm really thrilled to hear. Do you want me to pass you this? Are you going to sit oh, no. there or are you going to come okay. up? Okay. He's done it on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh, there you go. Okay. So I'll let you dive in. Okay. So um, I think that the critical barrier to sexual and reproductive health rights is basically shame. Shame, perceived stigma, and a lack of uh, assertiveness in asking for what you want. And that transcends cultures. Um, my experiences relate to India and South Africa. And I found that the social norms, uh, cultural attitudes, religious diktats, patriarchy, you know, the beautiful patriarchy that we have across cultures, it prevents women from really asking for what uh, is important to them. Um, and that needs to change. And I think we need to come up with a solution. We're, we're trying out some solutions, but it certainly does not you know, get better. So women should not be considered inferior. 
A, ever, and B, uh, they should be, uh, whenever they ask for services, they are considered aggressive. Yeah. So that's, that's like completely unacceptable in 2018. The second thing that I thought I could change was lack of access to actionable evidence-based information. So there's a lot of information on Google, right? Guru Google, and, and, and also on YouTube. So whatever hypothesis you have in your head, like if you don't want to take vaccination, or if you don't want to go for an abortion, you type, I don't want to go for an abortion, you'll get a set of videos that are going to give you why you should not go, and another set of videos that are going to give, give you solutions on why you should go. What I'm trying to say to you is, um, people are making decisions based on YouTube and Google, and that's not right. So we need to give them actionable, evidence-based information so that they are informed and they make empowered decisions. The third point is lack of access to products and services. And that's a huge, huge issue um, across cultures and across, across communities. So they need to have, whether we talk about menstrual hygiene products or we talk about contraceptive pills, it doesn't have to be a hush-hush thing. You know, It's so much of a hush-hush culture. Um, that it really prevents people from taking action and taking that. So that's that. Um, I want to tell you a story about an individual that really inspired me um, to, to work in this uh, field. I've always been, um, as I, I'm trained as a clinician, I'm trained as an epidemiologist, and I always wanted to look at um, you know, women's health issues from a systems perspective. But I always found that we are so restricted by the field we work in, that if you are in, in the clinical sciences, you only take care of one patient at a time, and you say, oh no, this is what I can treat, and this is what I can deal with, so I'm going to ignore the context. And the context from where the patient comes from keeps coming back into our lives. Because unless you deal with that context, you cannot really help change that person's life. So a few years ago, I was doing my research. When I transcended to doing research, I was doing this research at this place in Sevagram, which is actually the, the, the village that inspired Mahatma Gandhi to start the nonviolence movement in India. It's a beautiful village, and they have an excellent hospital. And we were trying to look at, um, and years ago, when there was no antiretrovirals, we were trying to look at HIV screening of uh, men. And there was this, uh, we, uh, I went to the wards and I just wanted to look at all the women. And there was this woman who was sitting there who actually shouted at me saying that, doctor, why are you dealing with all these men? They are giving us infections. You should be dealing with women. You know, we are getting the infections and we are the ones who, who are giving birth to babies and they are infected. So she almost like shouted at me and I'm like, I felt so bad. And I said, okay, my next project is gonna be in women and we're gonna save many lives. <laughs> and those are the kinds of patients that inspire you. They, they challenge you, they, they, they allow you and ask you to step out of your comfort zone. So we developed an oral round-the-clock screening strategy where we train people um, to think HIV and to screen them and to provide them treatment, test them, and that strategy was successful. It was translated into policy and that led to me doing Grand Challenges Canada arrived. And thank you to Peter Singer who taught integrated innovations. Uh, it changed the lives of academics like myself who really wanted to think out of the box and come up with solutions that work. I mean, we are, we are happy at um, you know, doing knowledge translation or methodology, but we really need to give products and services to people, to patients who really want them in, 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 in a manner that appeals to them. So, um, so thanks to Grand Challenges Canada, I developed this, this, this package of, which is related broadly to sexual and reproductive health. So, because I work in the field of um, HIV and STBBIs, I thought it was good to kind of offer a bigger package, a broader package of screening them for STI, BBIs, and use that as an opportunity to educate pregnant women as to how they should go about accessing services and how they should go about ask, asking for what they want. And that project was a big success. So, so I have some videos, I think I have some slides. Yeah, so 8SMART is, um, you can look at it here too. I can, it's right oh, there. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> is a multiplex point of care screening strategy that was funded by Grand Challenges. And um, we offered it, so the idea was to develop an app based program where we could screen pregnant women for multiple co infections other than HIV. We screen them for um, hepatitis, we screen them for, uh, for bacterial inf uh, infections, we also screen them for anemia. We also took that opportunity to educate people about um, access to safe abortions, um, consequences of um, not getting screened in time, 
and you know they end up with miscarriages, they end up with stillbirth, they end up with preterm labor. There's a whole slew of reproductive outcomes that happen if you don't take care of their um, uh, reproductive lives. And so this was, we, we educated, we recruited an army of 15 frontline healthcare workers. And of 15, five of them had exposure to some kind of um, you know, testing and counseling. 10 of them were lay women from the communities who were trained for two to three months. And we trained them on all aspects of testing and counseling and basically engagement with the patients. And uh, this project was done in a collaboration with CMC Vellore in rural Tamil Nadu. So we also did timely screening and diagnosis. You know, we screened them with many point of care testing technologies. We took that opportunity to really convey to them where the services are located, what they need to do, how they need to come back. And, um, um, and we were really wanting them to stay on because this was a project for 12 to 18 months. We wanted to track them. We gave them confirmatory testing. We got the physicians to give them care. And we brought testing closer to their homes and also um, services that they needed. So this project was a success. And what happened with it was uh, each of these peer workers became change makers. They inspired the women to take care of their reproductive health and sexual health. And they inspired them to take care of themselves during pregnancy. We also took that opportunity to talk to them about nutrition during pregnancy, which is another area that we don't talk about. Um, and if you have miscarriages or if you want an abortion, how do you go about it and how do you take care of your body? So all of those issues were covered that were beyond the mandate of the program. But we took that uh, opportunity to really um, pass on that information so that we could inspire them and make sure that they continued with our program. And guess what happened? So we were expecting that you know the traditional loss to follow up that you find in studies is about 20 to 30 to 40 percent. And we only had 5 percent losses to follow up. And why did we get that 5 percent? So we wanted to find out how many of 510 women, how many women did not come back. There were only 24 women who did not come back to Christian Medical College, which is a tertiary care center with great facilities. And the reason why they didn't come back was because the government of India had a program where they were giving them $200 to deliver in government facilities. So we said we're not going to incentivize, because incentivization is powerful. Yes, it is. But we didn't want to incentivize. And just by not incentivizing, and by just engaging with them and offering them high quality care closer to their homes, we were able to get them onto um, seeking these services. So that's an example. And now uh, with Grand Challenges, we're expanding this program. And, and we are, we're going to develop and um, get the adolescents to be involved because we figured that young women need more uh, handholding. And the inspiration for that um, for those products and services, you know, the, the women themselves came up with this, that they need tangible products, you know, to, 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 uh, uh, for themselves. And therein, um, we, we, uh, we decided to develop products. And, and, and the one, the inspiration for that was my daughter who's sitting in the audience, and I've pulled her out of school for a day. Um, I feel really guilty about that. But that's, that's working mom's guilt that we don't talk about in conferences. Uh, so she inspired me that. But, um, you know, I see in Canada, it's very hard to talk about sexual and reproductive health. And, um, you know, people have information, but they don't have the right information. They don't have the actionable information. And they certainly don't know where to go. And they will go to Google and YouTube first, mm -hmm. right? And if you go to YouTube and Google and you see the kind of junk that you get, you get good sites, but you also get bad sites. So, um, so we've got to focus that. And we've got to really provide those tangible services so that we can meet the needs of our end participants. And I'm happy to share with you that this 8SMART program was funded by the CIHR to be taken to scale across Canada in, in four Canadian provinces in marginalized populations so that we can expand and offer services. Because when I spoke to my colleagues here, they said, no, no, yes, Nikki, we need them here. We need this in Canada. There are a lot of people who would love to access these services. So I said, let's, let's make it happen. So I think there is a role for reverse innovation. There is a role for offering services that are personalized, that are catered to the needs of our end users, clients, participants, whatever you may call it. And there is a role for huge impact in terms of reproductive outcomes, um, public health outcomes, and of course, social impact. Thank you. Thank you.
And last but certainly not least, um, I'm really thrilled to have Cassandra here to share some of the work that she's been um, digging into in the last little bit. So Cassandra, take it away. Thank you. Um, so while we're, we're speaking about some of the, the key barriers to um, sexual health services and, and safe abortion, um, speaking broadly, I, I would say that restrictive laws and policies are probably the biggest barrier, and, and we heard a little bit about that, um, the situation in Rwanda. Uh, however, even in contexts where there are um, policies that are quite liberal in terms of abortion, that doesn't guarantee access, uh, particularly for vulnerable groups um, and underserved populations, such as unmarried young people um, who are often excluded from uh, sexual health services um, because they're directed uh, purely towards uh, married couples. Um, and, and for many unmarried young people, they face this double stigma um, around accessing, accessing abortion because um, you know, abortion itself is stigmatized, but also um, premarital sex is, is highly stigmatized as well in many contexts. Um, a few years ago, I was in uh, Nepal and I was speaking with uh, female community health volunteers uh, and their experiences after the law was liberalized um, in Nepal. And, and many of the women I spoke to, they were really supportive of, of the new policy and they had received training and, and they were providing information to women in their communities on how to access abortion. Uh, however, uh, what I found was really interesting was that um, even though they were involved in, in increasing access to safe abortion, they themselves um, were concerned that availability of abortion would lead to premarital sex or increase uh, premarital sex. So, um, you know, for, for several of the women I, I spoke to, premarital sex was actually more taboo and, and more highly stigmatized uh, than abortion itself. Um, and this is something that's not uh, unique to, to Nepal. Um, when you look at, uh, at Bangladesh, um, where menstrual regulation has been available for years, uh, decades, it's, uh, and menstrual regulation is, without going into too many details, is, is basically uh, abortion by, by a different name. Um, so this is widely available within the public health system. Um, but unmarried people are, are often excluded from this, uh, and that has um, horrible consequences um, where unmarried adolescents face a risk of unsafe abortion that's 35 times higher than married counterparts. Uh, so, um, you know, I've, I've used a few examples from, ne from Nepal and Bangladesh, but, you know, I think that there's a, a fairly common theme here um, for many places where social and cultural attitudes um, around premarital sex and, and associated myths uh, surrounding uh, virginity, um, they lead to violation of sexual and reproductive rights. Um, not only with access to abortion, but we, we see this tied to opposition to uh, comprehensive sexual health education in, in schools um, and, you know, as a driver for, for early and child marriage. Uh, so, you know, when we look at barriers to safe abortion, um, we might want to look at the particular context where, where we're working um, and also how certain social attitudes around um, SRHR more broadly, um, you know, impact not only um, access to safe abortion, but but other um, sexual and reproductive rights because they're they're so um, interrelated. Uh, and in terms of, of solutions for for overcoming uh, barriers, um, you know, there's there's various different avenues to overcome um, these barriers to to safe abortion. And you know, I think the obvious one is is, is legal and policy changes. Um, but you know, regardless of the policy environment, we also need to look at at service delivery um, and you know the role of healthcare workers because you know healthcare workers act as as a gatekeeper to abortion and other sexual health services. And um, most of us can think of ways in which healthcare workers can act as a barrier, turning people away, uh, shaming um, unmarried people for for premarital sex. But you know, also a big one is, is not respecting privacy or, or confidentiality. Um, so, however, uh, you know, we we have to look at the other side and recognize that healthcare workers are are key allies in improving um, sexual and reproductive health um, services uh, for young people. And and you know, many healthcare workers are are very actively engaged in facilitating access to people. And and you know, they might be the first point of contact as gatekeepers and uh, and help people to navigate the the various hurdles that um, they can encounter when when trying to terminate a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, 
So to, to address these service level barriers, I think we need to appreciate the, the role of frontline um, healthcare workers and the challenges that they themselves face, uh, including the balancing act that they have to do when, uh, when there are restrictions in place um, and they also want to provide you know, care uh, for, their, for their patients and, and their clients. And, and that can be a really um, tr tricky um, uh, role for them to be in to, to negotiate when, when you're in a restrictive environment um, but you still care about, about your patient. Um, so I think we need to look at, at supporting healthcare workers, sensitizing them to the needs of, of, of young people and, and um, the particular challenges and stigma that young people uh, face. Uh, and when, when you think about comprehensive sexual health education for young people um, in, in schools, uh, but you know, also looking at the curriculum for, for doctors, nurses, midwives, and other healthcare workers, um, you know, because it, it can be you know, entirely biomedically focused, um, and they don't necessarily receive any, any um, rights based um, on education. Um, so looking at you know, how can we engage and how can we mobilize healthcare workers, because they really are key, um, and they um, are, are wonderful allies uh, in this area and improving access to abortion. Um, so just to wrap up, I know we're, we're short on time, but uh, the reason I really wanted to, to emphasize the role of, of healthcare workers here today is that I know among the CAMWATCH membership, um, you know, including HealthBridge, uh, where I work, you know, many organizations are already working with uh, health authorities and frontline health workers through maternal health projects. Um, and so in many cases, the, the healthcare workers who are receiving training directly or indirectly through MNCH projects are the same healthcare workers that act as gatekeepers um, for sexual and reproductive health services um, and who sometimes themselves are, are um, performing abortions. So I, I understand there's, there's um, sometimes reluctance uh, to address the issue of improving access to abortion, uh, but for, for many of us in the sector, uh, we can continue to work with our existing partners and existing stakeholders, uh, and, and ex but expand um, in order to in include abortion in, in the activities that we, that we provide uh, and to promote access to, to safe abortion and to promote service delivery that you know, is sensitive you know, to the needs and to the rights of, of young people, including unmarried young people. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to give these three panelists who just infused a bunch of um, thoughts into our head about barriers and potential solutions um, a round of applause. And in the spirit of this rapid session that we've um, got this afternoon, I'm going to um, get us all to stand up. And um, you're all going to move to one of four um, corners of this room. And we've got Sandeep, I see in the back there, he's waving his hand, so he's going to man that one over there. Tina's going to come over here. Jenny is right here. Oh, and Shane, yeah, or one of them. And someone's in the, in the far corner there. Um, and so if we can, and Jenny's going to go over there. Great. So thank you to my facilitators who are going to help us walk through this. So as I mentioned before, um, what we're really interested in doing in this last 25 minutes um, is to rapidly crowdsource essentially the, um, from each of your various um, diverse perspectives, the key barriers to access to safe abortion. Um, this could be a theoretical exercise, um, and you can take it away as such. Um, but I'm actually very interested in this, and my colleagues Shane and, and Tina are very interested in this as a result of um, an upcoming um, uh, competition that we're going to be launching that is focused on innovations to increase the access of safe, safe abortion. And this is something that we are um, it, currently in a design phase. So what you tell us today is going to help shape what this looks like. Um, we are interested in anything across the spectrum of technological, social, and business innovations that may actually lead to this, but you don't have to worry about the solutions today. What we want to hear from you is as clear as possible what are the challenges. So um, I'm going to get everyone to stand up now, and I'm going to get you to kind of these four tables, go hang out with Tina there, these four tables come to Shane, the back four, six, um, go with Jenny, and the back four, six, go to um, Sandeep over there, and they're going to talk you through um, what we'd like you to do. Mm -hmm.